time. Um, Andrea Marston is a doctoral candidate in geography at Berkeley. Her work explores the cultural politics of the subsoil in Bolivia through ethnographic and historical work with geoscientists and small-scale miners. And her talk is titled Bodies of Flesh and Ore, Deep Earth Writing in Highland Bolivia. Thank you, Sharon. And thank you so much for organizing this. This has been such a wonderful generative event so far. And I have to tell you that today I was going to present a chapter of my dissertation, and then I read all the wonderful things that Sharon circulated, and I changed my mind. <laughs> um, so what I'm going to do actually is present a little bit about what I'm doing in my dissertation as a whole, give some little snippets of the chapter, and then reflect on earth, deep earth writing. So I work in Highland Bolivia in a region called Norte Potosí, which is famous for its tin mines, which spawned some of the most militant miners unions in the world in the 20th century. Mm -hmm. I focus on the twin towns of uh, Yayagua and Uncia, which are on opposite sides of the Juan del Valle mountain, um, which is right about where that red star is on the map. Um, between 1899 and 1985, tin mined from this mountain floated Bolivia's national economy. When the State Mining Corporation went belly up in 1985, with lots of political assistance to do so, company employees were given the option of staying on and forming so-called mining cooperatives to manage themselves. These ex-employees were joined by thousands of rural migrants, and over the last three decades, the number of cooperative miners working in this mountain has oscillated between two and 4,000. They are part of a nationwide shift from salaried unionized mining to scrappy cooperative mining. There are now 200,000 cooperative miners nationwide, which is four, four times, not 400, four times, the number of salaried mining employees in the country with a political influence to match. So my ethnographic work focuses on cooperative miners' experiences of laboring above and below ground. And I tack between nation building projects, um, histories of geological mapping and tin mining, um, in which Yayagua and Lucia played a central role, and contemporary realities of cooperative miners who work in the ruins of these nation building projects hollowed out mountains, slag heaps that are as large as, as the towns themselves, and these are what those look like on the ground, mm -hmm. and memories of past possible futures. I argue that geosocial formations for forged in the vertical contact zone between miners and rock perpetuate resource extractivism even in the contemporary era of supposedly indigenous nation building that Bolivia is sort of famously in right now. Bolivia's subterranean was produced as a national public space in the 20th century, imbued with masculinist and mestizo dreams of progress, and these nationalist ideas remain sedimented in the matter of the soil, of the deep earth. Crawling through the veins of nearly exhausted tin deposits, cooperative miners told me that they were willing to give their lungs to the nation and protect their right to do so with violence. Mm -hmm. And these subterranean politics reverberate on the surface when cooperative miners take to the streets or run for political office, both of which they do a lot. Um, the sphere of the political can no longer be thought to end at their feet. And just to give some very brief examples, on the left is a picture of a protest from 2016 that turned out very violently actually resulted in the murder of the Deputy Minister of the Interior. Um, up here is a, an interlocutor of mine who ran for parliament and got in successfully um, about a year after I met him, and a National Cooperative Miners, Women's, Women Cooperative Miners Congress. The implications of this argument extend well beyond Bolivia. They call for a rethinking of a boundary that is so deeply ingrained in the modern political imaginary that it usually goes unquestioned. The boundary between the living political surface and the non-living subterranean, below the soil, I'm talking about here in the rocky level. The latter of which is usually considered a repository of resources or a record of deep historical time at best. So the chapter I was going to present today is called Tin Bodies of Flesh and Ore. Throughout the dissertation, but especially in this chapter, I am interested in stories that circulate about cooperative miners in Bolivia, stories that are deeply informed by Marxist political economy, that characterize cooperative miners as entrepreneurial, petit bourgeois profiteers. 
Mining cooperatives are not cooperative in any of the usual senses of the word. They carve up the mountain into individual plots, much like small, small landholders. Um, they do not redistribute profits, which means that one miner might grow wealthy while another works for years at a loss. And um, they generally contract out their labor to third-party members who aren't actually members of the cooperative, third-party workers. So in this chapter, I ask, how are cooperative miners produ produced as political subjects in the material worlds in which they labor? Mm -hmm. Or more broadly, how do political subjects emerge from the rock? Mm -hmm. And I work with the term geosocial formation, which I borrowed from the Anthropocene literature, more specifically from Catherine Yusuf and Nigel Clark. Um, but I do something sort of different with it. And I chose to work with it because the word formation echoes the way that Bolivians talk about their personal political histories including both formal education and trade unionism. So the very common question is to formacion, what's your formation, can be sort of equally understood to mean what is your educational background and what kind of political organizing have you been involved in. When Bolivians speak about tin miners' unions of the mid-20th century, they often praise miners' level of political formation or their level of consciousness, which is the other word they always use. So using the concept of geosocial formations, I'm attempting to rework historical materialist approaches to political formation by showing how the meanings and materiality of tin shape workers' consciousness. But I'm also reworking the notion of geosocial formations by supplying some place-based specificity to discussions of the Anthropocene, which tend to elide labor as a site of geosociality. The anxiety about the Anthropocene tends to be a consumptive one. Humans, especially those in the global north, especially those with a lot of purchasing power, have transformed the material nature of the planet through consumption of subsoil resources. But none of that consumption can happen without someone or something digging in the earth. Labor must be part of the story, even if it's not the whole story. So given time constraints, I'm going to give you just two brief examples of the kind of work I do in this chapter. They both concern the gendering of the subsoil and, by, the ext by extension, those who work in it. Um, they also both concern my friend Dolly, who's one of only about 10 women who work underground in the Juan del Valle mountain. The first story is about skin, the organ that defines the edge of the body, and the second is about lungs, a subsurface organ deeply packed inside the ribcage. Dolly began working underground about 15 years ago when her husband, himself a cooperative miner, was injured on the job and entered a coma that would last more than six months. Struggling to feed six children and pay mounting medical bills, Dolly began to enter the mine under cover of night to work her husband's paraje, or work area. She had been doing this for months, accompanied every night by her older children, when her husband awoke. The doctor advised Dolly that her husband was not to be surprised, angered, or otherwise emotionally agitated since he was still in a delicate state. So Dolly and her children kept the work a secret. But a problem arose. Her husband began to ask questions about her smell. The subterranean, or at least the inside of the Juan del Valle mountain, has a recognizable brassy smell of rust and stagnant water. It clings to skin and hair long after washing. Dolly describes scrubbing her hands with the strongest chemical soap she could find, but the tiniest particles of earth remained lodged in her pores mm -hmm. from where they reached her husband's nose when she lifted a spoonful of soup to his mouth. Her husband was not fooled and he was furious, <coughs> yelling that women should not be going underground and weeping because his incapacity had forced her to do so. So fast forwarding to the present, Dolly and her husband now work alongside each other underground. They share the work of drilling, the most physically dangerous aspect of mining. Whoever is drilling spends hours in a billowing cloud of silica dust. Rates of silicosis, or black lung, are higher among cooperative miners than salaried miners because the former use comparatively cheap pneumatic drills rather than hydraulic drills, which would churn up mud instead of dust. Just as miners go inside the mountain every day, the mountain also slowly goes inside of them, settling into layers in their bronchial passageways, just as it once settled at the bottom of a Triassic lake. Dorley has been complaining of shortness of breath for a while, but she cannot get anyone at the local hospital to examine her. I visit the hospital to interview the pulmonologist on staff. 
He mounts three x-rays of lungs with various stages of silicosis for me to examine while we chat. Scarring from silica dust shows up like a thickening mist, which gradually turning the space inside the ribcage opaque. I ask if he has any x-rays of women's lungs. He shakes his head and informs me that women are not susceptible to silicosis. At first, he says that this is, women be is because women do not do any drilling. But when I tell him about Dordi, he suggests that women have stronger bodies that fight against the impurities of silica. Apparently, scarred lungs are an attribute of real minors that women are not quite permitted to attain. So in both of these cases, the materiality of the underground interacts differently with different bodies, or at least is perceived to interact differently in consequential ways. In both instances, the interaction between rock and flesh flesh is invisible to the naked eye, much the same way that the depths of the subterranean are invisible at the surface. All are perceived through proxies, senses of smell, x-rays, geological maps. All are gendered in ways that are not immediately apparent, but come to light through interactions with those who interpret them. So I conclude this chapter by stressing that geosocial formations are never uni formations. People are unequally contacted in the contact zone between rock and flesh. And this in geosocial formations always involve the hierarchical ordering of both human bodies and rocks in relation to one another. Gendered race and class social relations that stretch far beyond the, na the narrow passageways are recrystallized under pressure. In Yayabo Uncia, the metal tin, with all of its attendant geological and social histories, is the matter through which these relations are experienced. So in this final part of the talk, I'm going to go off the deep end, with no pun intended, to think about the practice of writing ore bodies and fleshy bodies together. In a way, both are skinned by the very word body. Metallic ores are usually found in igneous intrusions, that is, bubbles of magma that are shot up into sedimentary rock and cooled underground. This igneous intrusion is considered the body of the ore. And in this diagram, all these <coughs> orange sections here are the igneous intrusions, and they have different names depending on their shape and size and directionality. So the skin of this body is by no means an easy line to trace. Magma travels through pre-existing fractures in the sedimentary rock, meaning that the two geological formations are completely entangled. It is easier, perhaps, for us to pretend that the fleshy human body is whole and discreet, but Dolly's pores and lungs have told a different story, as do her hands and eyes and work clothes, and I could go on here. The gist is that muscle and mineral interpenetrate one another in sometimes surprising ways. <coughs> What's challenging is to move beyond an analysis like this one that ends by identifying entanglement. What comes next after realizing that there are rocks in her lungs and bones of miners in the rocks? Is there a way to write that does not require first conjuring the imaginary of a hermetically sealed body and then pointing out all of its leaks? So for inspiration here, I'm going to follow up on Jeff's presentation and turn to a recent science fiction series called The Broken Earth by N.K. Jemisin. Um, so first to say that this series, is the, she's the first author to ever win three Hugo Awards, the science fiction awards in a row, 2015, 2016, 2017, for this series, so you should all go read it. <laughs> um, and I'll try not to spoil too much. So this series takes place in a very distant <coughs> future world in which all continents have drifted into a single landmass. Um, that's it, very small up there. Um, this landmass is incredibly seismically active. Earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, and tsunamis are daily threats that occasionally cause centuries of mis misery. In this future, some humans have evolved organs in the back of their necks called sesapini that allow them to prevent and provoke Earth movement. Other humans fear these so-called origins, even though they rely on them to prevent daily disasters. Most of the origins are therefore sent away to boarding school as children to learn how to use their powers in the service of the empire. Those children that do not exhibit enough self-control, however, are lobotomized. Their sesapini are cut and they are transformed into node stations 
That is, they are held in drugged captivity for the rest of their life in locations spaced throughout the continent from where they subconsciously quell seismic activity in the region. This network of tortured children is framed as the condition of possibility for life on the rest of the continent, a necessary evil for the good of the majority. And I bring this series up for two reasons, beyond the obvious fact that I love them. Um, so first, it describes the context in which life and non-life are unquestionably intertwined. No one in the broken earth would argue that human social worlds and geological worlds could be held apart. It's impossible to conjure a hermetically sealed body. The deep earth as environmental milieu literally provoked an adaptation that is like a sixth sense. But the geosocial formation is not uniform and the adaptation is not evenly spread. Moreover, the fact that the happiness of some depends on the suffering of others is strikingly similar to our contemporary world, in which the ability of some to acquire products produced with the ores of the earth, which is just about everything, relies on someone else sucking rocks into her lungs and dredging her hands through cold water, or acid water. And what I'm saying here might remind many of you, and this has already been referenced today, of Elizabeth Povinelli's notion of ethical substance and her analysis of Ursula Le Guin's short story, The Ones Who Walk Away from Omelas, in which a town's happiness is predicated on a small girl being locked in a broom closet. But I believe that N.K. Jemisin's storytelling is more politi politically perceptive, and this is the second reason that I bring her up. Rather than a single girl child, which is the ultimate and deeply problematic symbol of innocence, Jemison is talking about the persecution of a large community, and rather than being locked in a broom closet, those with sesapenae are locked away and then forced to work on behalf of those without sesapenae. So Jemison, a black American woman, that's her in the picture there, recently said in an interview with Wired Magazine that the Broken Earth series was her way of processing the systemic anti-black racism with which she lives. She also noted that she drew inspiration from the horrors of indigenous residential schools to describe the abusive training grounds in which origin children are held hostage. And this picture is actually from some fan art, and it says, no voting on who gets to be people. I don't know who the artist is, I found it on Instagram, but um, <laughs> this is a quote from the third book in the series. So it's deeply political, everything she writes. So then, the broken earth is an overtly racist geosocial formation in which labor exploitation and incarceration are dialectically intertwined. And could there be a more adequate allegory for the times? So just to conclude very briefly, going deeper underground, writing earth wards, requires a new narrative style or new earth words. The words that Jemison invents to describe human adaptation to the dangers of Earth in the future brilliantly illuminate what we need in the present, new words with which to conjure already entangled realities rather than discrete bodies. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's all. So, um, one of the things that's really interesting to me about the people who invoke the Africa series is the dead, dead bodies, mm -hmm. right? So, and I wanted to think uh, about what you were doing about interpenetration and think about like, uh, I mean this is stuff, this, I did this talk on uh, microbial settler colonialism, mm -hmm. so how we learn to become settler, settler colonialists every day. Mm -hmm. um, and so one of the things that I think would be interesting for you to think through is what's missing mm -hmm. is microbial life, mm -hmm. right? because um, what you get in the lungs is alveoli, literally, so the tube stuff is brilliant because it follows the structure of the tubes in the lungs and the mm -hmm. alveoli which become pockets of minerals, yeah. right? So literally the lung structure mm -hmm. is the structure of a mind, right? right? But it's also, um, minds have, they, they do their geologic work because of microbial life. Mm -hmm. And what you're doing when you're, um, so the skin does its work because it has microbial life. The lungs do their work because it has microbial life. So it would be interesting to think about the question of liveness mm -hmm. rather than two forms of deadness, hmm. right? Dead flesh and dead rock. Mm -hmm. um, so I just, I'm yeah. just, I mean, you, you have a project, don't detour yourself, <laughs> but it's, <laughs> you know, I hate making people <laughs> read you an entire very well worked project. 
but it's worth at least having no, a footnote. No, it's definitely worth talking about and thinking about, and not very many people are writing about the life that is in the underground already, as right. in it's always just assumed to be a non-living space, right. when in fact it's, it's very not. alive. Yes. Right, exactly. I mean, there's this wonderful stuff that Humboldt has written about his early work as a mining student, in which yeah. he, mm-hmm. his job is actually finding life underground yeah. and categorizing it, right. the stuff that grows in the dark. Right. Um, I mean, and all of that. Yes. Right. No, it's super interesting. Exactly. Yeah. I think I want to work with, in part death, but in part just the idea of non-life, as mm-hmm. in something that really was never alive, mm-hmm. technically, when we think about that binary between mm-hmm. living and, between, you know, the living and dead, and mm-hmm. then the, the once alive and you know, never alive. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the binary that I want to focus on, even though that question of microbial life actually does help open up that in many mm-hmm. ways. So I definitely work with Theodore Dean mm-hmm. doing that. So what do you think? Good? Very quickly. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much. I just, you know, I can't believe I'm bringing in a reference from popular TV, but what the hell. <laughs> 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 but just this past Sunday on CBS's 60 Minutes, yeah. 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 really, that was a fantastic um, feature <laughs> on <laughs> South Africa. Uh-huh. South <laughs> Africa and the last gold mines, <laughs> you know, the gold is running out. They're going deeper yeah, and deeper and deeper. Mm-hmm. And this was an analysis of one particular mine whose line I can't remember, but you can find it in 60 minutes. And as they're going deeper and deeper, the, it's not just the miners now, but the scientists who are following them yeah. because they've discovered what they're calling extreme life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Have you seen this? I so have you not. might yeah. have to check it out <laughs> exactly. because exactly. And it, it connects with this. Yeah. And these are, you know, mm-hmm. little, you know, little I mean, you kind of see them with your bare eyes. Right. Little, yeah. right? Like tiny, but the tiny, scientists tiny. actually, yeah. so even if yeah. this mine yeah. is no longer going to yield gold anymore, mm-hmm. It might it's 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 something, something else, life. and they are and there's heart all heart these fantastic yeah, hypotheses exactly. about yeah. life on Mars, which yeah. you know yeah. is sort of maybe what this will be like. And huh. so cool. actually, your talk yeah. reminded me about that. Well, thank well, you. Well, thank you. Popular media has some yes, lines. stuff has some uses. <laughs> Jeff, <laughs> uh, you made a quick allusion, and it, it reminded me of why I really like your work. Uh, it's sort of the, the sort of socio natures hybridity mm-hmm. and sort of penetration, but then the kind of like what's next, like then what? Because I think a lot of us have been sort of schooled in a lot of this kind of social ecology, mortal human mm-hmm. hybridity stuff. Um, it's sort of like, okay, and then what? Mm-hmm. Um, so I just wondered if you could maybe allude a little bit more about how you're thinking that, or like mm-hmm. how you take that up, like what next? I mean, for me, it's all about the political work that it does in the world, as in, what uh, honestly for me right now is what happens when these miners get to the surface how are they interacting with various levels of um capital p politics and also sort of the micro politics of everyday life what is working underground how does it influence them on the surface that's sort of the so what for me um but it's a much broader question obviously that moves far beyond this um yeah Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.